Hey kiddos, welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion of solutions and today we're going to talk about how well things dissolve related to the temperature of the solvent and we're also going to talk about how well things dissolve related to the pressure over the solvent. So let's first talk about temperature. We call this enthalpy or heat of a solution. You might remember this demonstration from earlier in the year. I took some ammonium nitrate and dumped a whole bunch of it in a flask and I passed it around the room and you held it in your hand and you noticed that it got really really cold really really fast. In fact ammonium nitrate is the stuff they make those instant cold packs out of. When it dissolves in water it gets cold. So we say that it dissolves endothermically because we're adding heat from the surroundings to the solvation process. Now when you're holding it in your hand your hand becomes part of the surrounding, so we're taking heat from your hand and putting it into the solvation process. If we take heat from your hand, your hand's going to feel cold. That's right. So let's say we had a saturated solution of ammonium nitrate. Now you'll see this arrow goes both ways when we have a saturated solution. That means, yeah, it's dissolving, and I'm producing ammonium and nitrate ions in solution. But at the same rate, the arrow's going backwards. I'm also forming solid ammonium nitrate. So my crystal is breaking apart. Water molecules are surrounding those ions, pulling them away. But there are also some ions coming back to the crystal and forming the solid again. So at that particular temperature, I've dissolved as much ammonium nitrate as possible. So let's put delta H, heat, on the proper side. Now since this is endothermic, remember we're adding heat to the system. So I'm going to put it on the reactant side, delta H. If you remember, delta H is kind of like my fireplace. I don't know if you remember this analogy from a few videos ago. Here's a fireplace. That's my heat. So I'm having heat on the reactant side for an endothermic reaction. Now what would happen to this equilibrium, to this flask of saturated ammonium nitrate, if I were to heat it? Well, let's think about Le Chatelier's principle. You might also remember Le Chatelier's principle. It simply states that when a stress is placed upon the system at equilibrium, the system will shift in a direction to relieve the stress. You might remember we did an analogy with a little girl coming in from the cold. So if she's really, really cold, and she sees a fireplace inside, she's going to go towards that fireplace because she's really, really cold. There's a stress on her system. And to relieve that stress, she's going to go towards the heat. But after a while, you can imagine she's going to get pretty warm. So when the temperature, when she becomes really, really warm, that's also placing a stress on her system. When she gets warm, she's going to move away from the heat. Well, the same type of things happen with these um, solvation processes. So here's a solution that dissolves endothermically. If I were to heat it, which way would the equilibrium shift? Would it shift towards the heat? No, that's just going to compound the problem, isn't it? It's actually going to shift away from the heat. So more ammonium ions dissolved in water will form and more nitrate ions dissolved in water will form. The solubility will increase when I heat it up. So, would ammonium nitrate be more soluble in hot or cold water? Yeah, we just answered that question. It would dissolve better in hot water because ammonium nitrate, as with most solids, dissolve endothermically. Now notice I said most solids dissolve that way. Here's an example of a solid that dissolves exothermically. Now I decided not to pass this demonstration around the room. Sodium hydroxide is very corrosive. Um, if you were to have dropped that flask of sodium hydroxide dissolving in water and it splashed on your skin or clothing, it would cause some problems. So trust me on this. Sodium hydroxide dissolves exothermically. So let's put delta H on the proper side. If it dissolves exothermically, heat is being released during the solvation process. So I'm going to write it as a product. Okay, so what would happen to this equilibrium if it were heated? Let's think about that for a minute. In fact, if you need to, think about the little girl in the fire. Let's see, here's my little girl. 
All right, there we go. And I'm heating it up, so it's getting really hot. Is she going to go towards or away from the fire? That's right. She's going to go away from the fire when I heat it up. And when she goes away, more solid sodium hydroxide will form. So its solubility actually decreases when I heat it. So it's more soluble in cold water. And there are a few solids that do dissolve exothermically, and so they would dissolve better. Their solubility would increase with a decrease in temperature. All right, let's think about gases now. It turns out that all gases dissolve exothermically. There are no exceptions. So let's put delta H. You put delta H on the proper side. If carbon dioxide gas dissolves in water to form carbon dioxide A cubed, and I just told you, it dissolves exothermically, what side would I put delta H on? That's right. Heat's exiting the system. It's being released to the surroundings. If you held it in your hand, <laughs> the heat would be being released to your hand. It would get hot, wouldn't it? So delta H would be on the product side. Now let's think about the effect of that. Let's talk about fish, fishies for just a second. Trout are very active. They require lots of oxygen. So you will notice, if you fish for trout, that they like to go to deeper water in the summertime. Why do you think they like to go to deeper water? Yeah, they want more oxygen, okay. And why would they find more oxygen in deeper water? Yeah, because it's colder in deeper water, isn't it? Now, how does that help out the trout? Well, let's think about our little girl here, okay. If she's cold, isn't she going to go towards the heat? Yeah, and that's where more carbon dioxide dissolved in water will be formed. Well, in this case, the fish don't want carbon dioxide. We have oxygen gas at equilibrium with oxygen dissolved in water. And so if that dissolves exothermically and I make it colder, it will shift to the right and more O2 gas will be formed, what will be found at those uh, deeper levels in the water. So they go to deeper, uh, they, they go to deeper water in the summertime because the water is colder there and there's more O2 dissolved. Think about soda pop for a second, if you would. If you have a bottle of soda pop in your refrigerator and you decide to pour yourself a glass of soda pop, right, and it's sitting at room temperature, don't you see bubbles forming on the side of the glass? right, and rising. Yeah, that CO2 carbonation in your soda pop is coming out of solution. One of the reasons it is, is because the temperature is increasing. You put it in your mouth where it's really warm, hold it in there for a second before you swallow it, and you can feel it foam up in there because a lot of gas is coming out of solution as the temperature increases. Um, catfish, bass, and perch don't have high oxygen requirements like trout do. They're not nearly as active. So they can, dis they can survive in warm lakes like Lake Powell. However, trout cannot. And that's for the reason we just mentioned. If they have a high oxygen requirement, they're going to need colder water because we can dissolve more O2 in that colder water than we can in warmer water. Let's take a look at a graph of that quickly. Now, I know you can't see the labeling of the x-axis very well, but this is a, um, a graph of solubility of, a, of gases in the unit milligrams of that gas per 100 grams of water versus temperature in degrees Celsius. So my x-axis, kiddos, is temp in degrees Celsius. Alrighty, so here is 10 degrees Celsius. Let's look at oxygen gas. Oxygen is the green line here. So at 10 degrees Celsius, it looks like I can dissolve, I don't know, somewhere maybe around 5.5 grams of milligram, five and a half milligrams of oxygen per 100 grams of water. What if I warm that up to 30 degrees Celsius? So right there on my graph is 30 degrees Celsius. What just happened to the solubility of the oxygen in water? Yeah, it drops substantially. Now it might be 3.5 milligrams of oxygen per 100 grams of water. So what would happen if I took that solution that had um, oxygen dissolved in it at 10 degrees Celsius 
and warmed it up to 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah. This much oxygen gas would come out of solution. It would bubble out of solution. Okay, so an increase in temperature decreases the solubility of gases, and a decrease in temperature increases the solubility of gases. Try to remember that. All right, let's talk about pressure a little bit. How does pressure affect solubility? Well, let's discuss solids first. If I increase the pressure over my solvent, and I'm trying to dissolve sugar or salt, I'm trying to dissolve something solid in water, it will have no effect on its solubility. It just doesn't change the solubility at all. So pressure has no effect on the solubility of solids. However, when we talk about gases, when I increase the pressure over the solvent, what happens to the solubility of gases? Well, let's think about soda pop again. Don't we store soda pop in the supermarket under high pressure? Yeah, when you crack that lid, you can hear that gas dissolve. Let's take a look at a graph, another graph. This graph has solubility um, in millimoles per liter. Don't worry about the unit for right now, versus pressure. Now, I know you can't see the x-axis very well on this video, but this is my pressure in atmospheres. Okay? Uh, right here on my graph is about a half of an atmosphere. And let's look at oxygen again. So at a half of an atmosphere, it looks like I can dissolve, I don't know, maybe 0.65 millimoles of oxygen per liter of water. Let's increase that pressure to one atmosphere. So on my graph, this is one atmosphere. And if I increase that pressure to one atmosphere, it looks like I can dissolve a lot more oxygen in my water, can't I? A lot more. So under high pressure, you can dissolve lots of gas. Under low pressure, you can't dissolve as much. So what if I'm at high pressure and I release that pressure? What's going to happen to all that gas if I go from one atmosphere to a half of an atmosphere very quickly? Yeah, all of this oxygen gas will bubble out of solution. We'll see bubbles forming in my glass. Hmm. Well, there's actually a pretty cool application to this. Um, if you've ever scuba dived before, you know that there's a big concern about these rapid changes in pressure. So let me try to draw a picture for you to help illustrate this. So let's say that you are a scuba diver, and here you are on the ocean. Okay? So we're going to put a little diving mask on you. Uh, you're swimming on the surface of the ocean. A little diving tank, uh, you got a little respirator in your mouth, etc. Okay, and you're frolicking on the surface of the ocean, but of course you're in your diving gear because you want to investigate what's going on below the water. So you look down below and you see a shipwreck. So here is an old ship that's wrecked. Put a big hole in its hull because it's a shipwreck. It must have been shot by a cannon or something, right? And beside that ship, you see a treasure chest. So I'm going to try to draw a treasure chest. Does that sort of look like a treasure chest to you? Yeah, sort of. Matter. You guys get the idea. And so you want to go investigate that shipwreck. Now that shipwreck is, let's say, this is sea level, and that is 60 feet down. Okay? Now it turns out that um, for every 30 feet of water that you go down, you increase the pressure by one atmosphere. So here you are at sea level on a typical day, and the pressure is one atmosphere. If you go down to 60 feet, won't the pressure be, let's see, every 30 feet is another atmosphere. Won't it be up to three atmospheres? Yeah. So let's go down there, and you're investigating your shipwreck. And you're just having a grand old time. You know, you find the treasure chest. You look through there. You get some pirate booty or whatever it's called. And, and oh, we forgot your fins, didn't we? Jeez Louise. All right, so let's throw some fins on there. Okay, there we go. All right, so you're investigating that, and you're breathing uh, oxygen, and it's probably mixed with nitrogen from your, from your tank. And what's happened to the solubility of that gas in your blood now that you're at three atmospheres of pressure instead of one? That's right. Solubility of gases increase 
when you increase the pressure. So more gas is dissolving in your blood right now as you're at the bottom of the ocean investigating this shipwreck. Well, um, unknowingly, um, behind you, a shark sneaks up on you, and this is a shark. So there's my shark. All right, so a shark sneaks up on you, and boy, you turn around and you see it, and you're pretty scared. I'm, I would be. And so what do you immediately do? Yeah, you immediately say, I need to get, I, I need to get away from that shark. So you quickly go to the surface. You try to escape that shark. Oh boy, you've escaped maybe certain death um, from that shark eating you up um, to maybe now an uncertain future because the pressure has just changed from three atmospheres to one atmosphere. It's gone down by a third from what it was just a minute ago. What's going to happen to all that gas that's dissolved in your blood? Yeah, it's going to start coming out of solution. It's going to start bubbling out of solution. Now that accumulates in your joints. <laughs> and if a bubble forms near your heart, it could cause a heart attack. And near your brain, it could cause a stroke. And if it forms in your lungs, it can cause some serious pulmonary problems. You need to get, you need to, get to a hospital very quickly with a pressure chamber to, to, to change that effect if possible. But in the meantime, you're suffering from tremendous pain because as these bubbles accumulate in your joints... Um, they cause severe pain. And the only way to get a little bit of relief from that severe pain is crumpling up into a little ball, into a fetal position. And this became known as the bend. So when people first started scuba diving, this started happening, and people started suffering from this problem they ended up calling the bends. And that's related to all that gas coming out of solution so quickly. So if you're an experienced scuba diver, um, you don't come up, first of all, you only spend a certain amount of time on the bottom. They call it bottom time. And then when you come up back to the surface, you do so very slowly. And the deeper you go, the more cautious you have to be in your return to the surface because the gas will come out of solution much more slowly. You know that if you open up a bottle of pop very slowly, um, you can release that pressure slowly and it doesn't come out of solution so quickly and foam out the top. But if you do it very quickly, that gas comes out of solution very quickly and you have a big mess on your hands. The same type of thing can happen in your blood if you're a scuba diver. Anyway, hope that helps you remember that. All right, kiddos. We'll talk to you soon and we'll continue talking about solutions in the next video. Bye.